What's the story, Morning Glory? What's the word, Hummingbird? Thank you so much for clicking on my channel and for joining me for this review of 90 Day Fiance Happily Ever After Season 8, Episode 9, The Lovely Duckling. So let's get started with Emily and Kobe. We are still in Cameroon because keep in mind that we have a whole wedding to do in Cameroon before Kobe, Emily, and her parents come back to America. So Emily and Kobe, they're at the market and they're getting food together because Emily is supposed to be making a traditional Cameroon meal for Kobe. Kobe's family. So they get all the ingredients that they need and they get back to their Airbnb that they're staying at and they show the food to Emily's parents and they showed um, Emily's mom something. I don't know. I'm not sure exactly what it was. Um, but when they showed it to her, she said that it was something that you would feed to a dog, which I thought was extremely rude because you can't tell people that the food that they traditionally eat, you yourself would feed to a dog. Uh, I thought that was just really rude and unacceptable that she said that. But she, to me, that woman kind of comes off as she seems kind of snooty, a little bit entitled. Um, she just has this air of, I don't know what it is, like an air of superiority about her. She's just I don't know. I don't care too much for Emily's mom. And I think that Emily is like a, a, a like an, her attitude and her personality is almost like a complete replica of her mom, but even more rude in a way. Um, the only one that I can tolerate is Emily's father and Emily's sister. But anyway, so the mom says something really rude about this particular item of food saying that it's something that she would feed to a dog. Now, when they showed the same item to her father, her father said that it looked like um, he compared it to I forgot if he said like a bagel or he, he compared it to another type of western food he didn't say that it was something that you would feed a dog and you know he can kind of he just compared it to another type of American or westernized food he was nowhere near as rude as his wife was so um Kobe's sister she comes over and she is going to be teaching and helping Emily make this African meal so the next morning Kobe Emily and her parents uh they're out having breakfast I think they're sitting on the veranda or the front porch of their Airbnb and they're making they're talking about the wedding preparations and they're gonna have like a very traditional Cameroon wedding and so like there's a list of things that Emily's parents can ask for from Kobe's family and so David Emily's father some of the things that he wanted was an umbrella a goat um, African shirts <laughs> and then when it came time to talk about the dowry or the bride price all of a sudden Emily's mom is highly offended and the idea of like selling her daughter for a monetary value you um it's just not sitting well with her at all so she's telling Kobe how you know this is going against everything that she believes in you know how are we supposed to sell our daughter you know put a monetary price on our daughter and I'm listening to this woman and I'm just like girl please don't act like this idea of selling a person is uh, is new to you uh you do understand the history of the country that you that you came from um so don't act like this whole idea is like a shock to your system it's absolutely new to you it's absolutely foreign to you um considering you know the history of the united states and slavery etc cetera, etc cetera. i'm not saying that she should like the idea of selling her daughter to kobe's family but the way that she was just so like horribly offended by this it was like something she's never even heard of so Kobe and Emily's father David they kind of understood they were like you know it's not like you're literally selling her to Kobe's family um it's like a, it's very symbolic it's just symbolic uh, it's a way of them showing their appreciation for you giving them their daughter because in I think in these type of cultures, um, the bride dowry and all of that, which is very well known across the world, so many different cultures and countries uh, have followed this type of tradition. It's kind of like, you know, the family of the bride, they're giving up 
their daughter, someone who would be very resourceful for the family. You know, she would do the cooking and the cleaning and helping out her parents and helping the family and do all of that. So they're giving all of that up. And so in turn, um, the groom's family will compensate the bride's family with money. And so Kobe's trying to explain to his mother-in-law that this is just symbolic. You're not literally selling her. It's just showing how my, my family is showing appreciation to your family for allowing us to take in Emily. But you know, the woman was acting like she didn't get it. She didn't understand. Um, she was just trying to act dense for no reason. And Kobe said that this has to be done culturally. Um, this has to be done or else his family, like his wife and his children could be cursed. And it's disrespectful to the ancestors to not follow this tradition all the way down to a T. So I think that the mom was making a big deal about nothing. All of this is just really symbolic because hello, Kobe and Emily are already married. Okay. They already have two kids and now they've had a third. So this is, all of this is just symbolic lady, like relax and calm down. Moving on to Ed and Liz. So Ed and Liz finally have a face-to-face -face meeting. They decide to meet in a coffee shop to talk about the fact that Ed had called off the wedding. As we all knew, him calling off the wedding had nothing to do with Emily, with um, Liz's daughter saying that the food was too spicy and Ed telling her to be, you know, stop acting like a baby and Liz blowing up on him in front of his family. It had nothing to do with that at all. He just doesn't want to be in this relationship anymore. You know, he's just doing the typical Ed thing, um, which is, you know, being very rude and hurtful to the women in his life. So he doesn't want to go through with the wedding. It had nothing to do with Ed, Liz getting mad at him for telling her daughter that she needed to stop being a baby because she didn't want to eat spicy food. So... Liz, I don't know what's wrong with Liz, but Liz was like saying how she doesn't want to give up on her relationship with Ed. She still wants to make things work. And I'm like, I need Liz to tell me, get just list three things. All I'm asking for Liz is three things of why you love Ed so much. What is it about Ed that we're not seeing that makes you want to stay in this relationship with him? Because ever since I've seen them together, it's just been like, he's so rude to her. You know, he's extremely rude to her. Um, like rude to the point where he'll say things that hit below the belt. Rude to the point where like, he'll just embarrass her for no reason in front of people. And it always seems like she's the one that's really trying to keep everything together. She's the one that's um, showing all this love and affection to him. I just need her just three things, Liz. Tell me just three things of what you see in this man that makes you want to stay with him after, after he has called off the wedding and told you that he didn't want nothing to do with you. Just three things. So she tells us that she doesn't want to give up on her relationship. Uh, she also says that she's upset that she had to find out from other people that he wanted to end or he wanted to call off the wedding because, you know, he was too chicken to tell her himself. Um, Ed tells her that he just wants to be single and he wants to work on his career. What career? What is Ed's career? His real estate career that they barely, that they're not even licensed yet? Like what career is he trying to work on? Liz said that she helped him become a better man. She helped him become a better man. And so like all this work that she's put into him, it was all for nothing. But now, cause now he's going to, um, all the improvements that he's made, another woman is going to enjoy. Now, I don't know what the hell Liz was talking about because to me, Ed actually has kind of gotten, well, he's always been the same. I can't say he's gotten worse or better. I don't know how she's improved him to me. It seems like he's even nastier than he ever was before. So he says that he fell out of love with her. I'm beginning to wonder if it's another woman, if he found like a younger, better model. And so that's what he'd rather go for, for the next round of 90 day fiance, whatever. Um, Cause it's just like, it was so abrupt. Like all of a sudden y'all are planning this wedding. Everything is falling into place. You're begging her mom to give you a chance to try to get to know you better because you promised her mother that you're going to take care of Liz, that you're good for Liz. Then all of a sudden you're calling off the wedding. Is there another woman involved? Like what the hell is going on? Excuse me. So he says he's fallen out of love with her. And Ed says, well, if you ever meet anybody like me, please run. And Liz says, I just want to meet anybody else. Liz, three things, <laughs> three things, please <laughs> just list me three things of what it is that you find so irresistible about Big Ed.
What is it? I can't even say that it's his personality. He might be funny. Ed might be funny. I think he's got, you know, he's got like a, a very dry sense of humor. He might be funny. What do you find so appealing about Big Ed Liz? I need to know what the hell is going on because I don't get why you're sitting in that coffee shop crying, crying your heart out. You can't even breathe because you're crying so hard with this because this man is breaking up with you. Like, how did you let it get this far? And so Ed says he wants to work on his career, right? He has to break up with her to work on his career. And I'm thinking how Liz gave up her career to be with him because she was um, partners. She was a partner in this um, restaurant back in California. You know, one of her friends had asked her to go into business with him and running this restaurant. And she gave all of that up to run to Arkansas to be with Ed. She gave up all of that for Ed. And Ed is like, I'm not going to give up a damn thing for you. In fact, I don't even want to marry you anymore. I want to be uh, free and single. Moving on to Rob and Sophie. Okay, side note. Sophie's mom got arrested, like in real time. Um, there was a mugshot of her going around on the internet. I forgot what she got arrested for. Um, people were speculating that Sophie's mom is still... Um, She's still a substance abuser. Um, she just got arrested. I forgot what she got arrested for. I didn't even bother to look it up. But her mugshot's out there. So <laughs> she's been a very bad girl. But she's got the audacity to talk about Rob when, you know, her own stuff is completely messed up. Anyways, moving on. So Rob and Sophie, they're on their way to couples therapy. Um, Sophie tells us that she never found Rob's second phone. Um, whatever who cares they're at the therapist now and they're talking about how they met how they met online when people say i'm we met online i need to know <laughs> what do you mean you met online you met on an app you met because you slid into somebody's dms you met like how did y'all did you meet like how do y'all meet online like what does that even mean so Rob said at the time that he met Sophie, he was looking for a girl that was really down to earth. I guess he's still looking because I don't see Sophie as anybody that's down to earth. I don't see that at all. Um, to me, Sophie seems to be very high maintenance. She seems to be like one of, she's like a Kardashian wannabe or something where it's all about, you know, um, selfies and duck lips and, you know, wearing things or like three sizes too small to show off, you know, your attributes online. I I've yet to see anything about Sophie that's down to earth. So Sophie brings up the whole online cheating. Oh my God. The, as much as she brings up online cheating, is he still doing it, Sophie? Is this the reason why you keep bringing it up? Because I'm so sick and tired of you bringing up his online cheating. Because I thought y'all had resolved that. I thought Rob said he had stopped doing that. You decided to still marry this man because you, he told you he stopped doing it. You keep bringing it up as if he is still doing it. Is he still online cheating? If he isn't, if he stopped, if you don't have any proof that he's still doing it, why are we still talking about online cheating a year or so into your marriage? So she talks about the online cheating. She talks about the lack of intimacy. She said that she cut him off um, because of the fact that she keeps thinking about the, the women that he follows online. Um, they keep popping up into her mind. So she feels like he's more attracted to that type of woman than he would be to her. So she doesn't feel desirable at all. So there's no intimacy between them. Plus, he constantly makes her want to put on costumes and she doesn't want to do that. Like, you know, she feels like the only way that she can find me attractive is if I'm if I'm if I'm wearing some type of a maid's costume or a bunny costume so there's no more intimacy between them so they go back to the women that he follows online now Sophie said that he likes to follow or that he is drawn to women who are like those bodybuilding type of women you know who are like super super buff you know who could are comparable to like the men bodybuilders you know they have the big muscles muscles popping up everywhere and they do all of the um uh, the muscle competitions. That's the, the impression that she was giving me when she talks about those are the women that he's attracted to. Those are the women that he follows. And Rob says, absolutely not. He says, that's not what I'm attracted to. Um, he, she, he says that I'm more attracted to like the fitness, the fitness, uh, the fitness models. There's a big difference between your fitness models and your bodybuilding <laughs> models. There's a big, big difference. Okay, the fitness models, they are toned, they are trimmed. Um, 
they don't really work on developing their muscles like that big where your body, whereas your bodybuilding models, you know, it's all about having the biggest muscles and accentuating every single muscle in your body. So they go back and forth on that. He tries to convince us that I'm not into that. I wonder if the reason why he was offended is because, well, I'm not going to say, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But anyways, he's like, no, I'm not into that. So Sophie says, um, and I wish they would, I wish Sophie would have like shown us a picture of the type of women that she claims he's into. So I can get a better understanding of what she's talking about. Because if he says he's more into the fitness training type of women, the fitness models, maybe to her, that's like over muscular, even though they're really not maybe to her, because she's not someone she's, she's not toned. Um, she doesn't like lift or do weights or anything like that. It looks like she doesn't maybe to her, a woman who does that, who wants to be more toned, but not necessarily uber muscular. She sees that as being very muscular because I need to know what she's talking about. Um, I feel like she might be exaggerating. I seriously don't think that <laughs> Rob is, um, following those type of muscular, super, super muscular type of women. I seriously doubt that. I don't know why she wants to put that on him. Okay. Rob says that when he watches adult films, he watches the normal stuff. He says, I watch normal stuff. I'm not a freak. I'm not into any kind of weird kink. I watch the normal stuff where the women resemble Sophie. They have body types that are like Sophie because I think Sophie is the most beautiful woman in the world. Sophie tells Rob that she needs constant reassurance and um, she needs positive affirmations. Um, she needs to be told that she's beautiful, that he's attracted to her. And so he starts off by doing that he's like oh, okay um, when I look into your eyes you know your beautiful eyes blah 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 it makes me want to take you home and do some stuff to you and I was like what excuse me huh but she liked it honey so she was like yeah I like that and so um the therapist, you know, she gives her analysis about their relationship and what they need to do. Honey, don't nobody care because people keep telling me that in real life, Rob and Sophie actually broke up. So I'm not going to go too much into um, what the therapist suggested for them to do to better their relationship because evidently they didn't do it because I think they're broken up in real life. Moving on to Jasmine and Gino. So Jasmine and Gino, they go to the Ms. International World Workshop because Jasmine is considering entering a beauty pageant. So they go to the workshop that her friend Leandro has suggested and she meets the other women that are there, which was like about four or five of the women that were there. And so she meets all of them. Um, the women were very pageantry. Okay. When they introduced themselves to Jasmine, it was, they're like, they were very fake and phony and very pageantry. Um, one woman was like, hello, beautiful. My name is blah, blah, blah. And it was just so like, what are we, what is going on? What am I watching? So she also meets the CEO of the beauty pageant. And so she tells the group that she's really worried about entering the pageant because of her age. She's like 37, 38 years old or something. And one of the women tells her, don't worry about that because I'm 44. So don't let that stop you if you really want to do this. And then she talks about her alopecia. And I'm like, Jasmine, why are we unloading all of this information? as soon as you meet these strangers okay I think it's all for attention because when she starts talking about her alopecia and her losing her hair she said that she even considered shaving her head off and you know one day she's going to be completely bald and she starts crying and so all the women gather around her to soothe her and comfort her and I'm just like Jasmine does this for attention because everywhere she goes even when she's with Gino's family she has to tell some sob story where she ends up crying um constantly so to her to me it's just like She's just doing this for attention. Um, and, you know, they all gather around her to try to comfort her. And then she says something about how she felt like this sense of sisterhood with all these women. And I wouldn't be surprised if Jasmine was the kind of woman that would sabotage um, her competition in order to win the competition, to, to win the pageant. I wouldn't be surprised if she would backstab every single one of these women. But here she is talking about she felt a sense of sisterhood. So later on, they go back to Leandro's house. It's their last night in Miami. Um, they're going to be grilling outside. 
and um, they tell Leandro what happened with the workshop. And so Gino, he's encouraging Jasmine to join the pageantry, to do the pageant. And then he says to her, but one thing is, is that what if you end up getting pregnant while you're doing the pageant? You know, you're going to have to drop out. And this is when Jasmine decides to be upfront with Gino and tell him that they are not on the same page when it comes to having a baby. And Gino's like, what do you mean we're not on the same page? And Jasmine says, well, I'm not ready to have a baby right now. And he says to her right now or at all ever. And then Jasmine says, I don't know. And he was like, what do you mean you don't know? And then he says, so you made this decision completely, completely on your own. You didn't even consult it with me. You didn't talk about it with me at all. You just made up your mind that, you know, you're not ready to have a baby right now. So he's upset about that. And then he ends up going to bed. He leaves like, you know what? I'm going to bed. And I don't know. I don't know what to say. I really don't know what to say. I really think that Jasmine misled him into thinking that she did want to have a baby with him. I think she did mislead him. But um, I don't know how deeply they talked about the possibility. Because if you're talking about having children and y'all are the ages that y'all are at, you know, Jasmine is already at the advanced maternal age. And Gino is, you know, a breath away from turning 60. Y'all need to talk about timelines. It's not like y'all are in your early 20s when it's like, yeah, we're going to have kids someday. No, at the ages that y'all are at, when y'all talk about family planning and having children, y'all need to be talking about specific timelines and dates. Like, okay, I'm 36, 37 years old. You're close to 60. Let's talk about when this is going to happen because we don't have much time. And I think that when they did have these type of discussions, the discussions were very vague. And that's why right now they are not on the same page about anything, because I don't think they talked about it deeply enough. I think they just assumed that the other person was completely on board with what they wanted. I think Jasmine felt like she was just go going to always keep it vague. And oh, yeah, we'll have kids someday, Gino. Don't worry, we'll have babies someday. And whereas Gino was thinking, OK, we're going to have babies as soon as possible. So this is the reason why supposedly they're not on the same page. Jasmine don't want no babies. Gino, please accept the fact when someone tells you, well, I don't know if I really want to have, just assume that they don't want to have kids. Just deal, it, deal with it that way. Just accept the fact that Jasmine does not want to have any children. So now you need to figure out if this is something that you want to stay in or, or leave behind. Moving on to Ashley and Manuel. So Ashley and Manuel are still in New York and or New York City and or is it New Jersey? Who knows? So they are meeting up with Manuel's friend, Jonathan, and they're going to have like a discussion about their damn relationship. I'm so sick and tired. <laughs> oh, God, I'm so sick and tired of Manuel and Ashley talking about their relationship. And Jonathan is going to be like the mediator. So Jonathan says that he's already heard Manuel's side of the story about why they've been fighting so much lately. And now he wants to hear Ashley's side of the story. So when they meet, when they all sit down together, Ashley tells Jonathan that, um, there's lack of communication and there's lack of trust between them. So Manuel talks about how the reason why he never told Ashley why that particular morning he was going to meet up with Jonathan, but you know why he didn't tell her. So he says, you know, if I tell you, you're going to question me, you're going to interrogate me. Where am I going? Who am I going with? Who's all going to be there? Take a picture of where you're at. So, um, I can believe that you are where you say you are. And then you're going to want to know, why can't I go along? How come I can't come with you? So that's the reason why I didn't tell you. So obviously, you know, it goes left. And um, Manuel ends up walking away because they're arguing. So he ends up walking away and Ashley starts crying. And she says, even though, you know, we're having all these issues, I still feel bad for the guy because in Rochester, there's not a big Hispanic community. So there's not a lot of people that he can be friends with that speak the language. Uh, so, you know, I do, I still feel bad for him because he's so isolated from his family, from his friends. So I still feel for the man, even though, you know, he treats me like this. So Jonathan tells Ashley that, that they need to just both start over, both apologize to each other and let's just start all over again. So when Manuel comes back, because Manuel, yeah, because when, so when Manuel comes back, Jonathan tells Manuel, look, why don't you just apologize to each other? Both of you say you're sorry and then we can just move on from there. And Manuel was like, I'm not apologizing. I didn't do anything wrong. She needs to apologize to me. So then Ashley gets upset and she's like, this is what I'm talking about. Um, 
He doesn't take any accountability. It's always my fault. He doesn't acknowledge anything that he does wrong. And then Manuel says, okay, if it's all my, if you think it's all my fault, then it's all my fault. It's all my fault. Shoot me in the head. It's all my fault. Everything is my fault. But, so because he's being so flippant about it, Ashley gets upset and she ends up walking away. <laughs> Y'all, it's tiring. <laughs> It is so tiring. It is so tiring because it's the same damn thing. I don't have any suggestions on how it should be between them other than maybe they need to get a divorce. I don't know what else to say because it's the same thing every week. Uh, She doesn't trust him. She doesn't understand why she doesn't, he doesn't incorporate her more into his family he feels like he's being too controlled and she's too controlling and she's too demanding and neither one of them wants to really change or own up to anything and it's just it's frustrating it's boring and it's tired and played and i'm over it moving on to thais and patrick so after they meet with thais's dad um they're driving back to their hotel no they're driving back to their apartment because Patrick has an apartment in um Brazil so they're driving back to their apartment and um they're arguing because Thais is upset that Patrick did not ask for her father's blessing and Patrick explains to her I think it's too late to ask for a blessing. So I'm not going to ask for a blessing just to ask for one. Um, When that time comes around, I'm going to ask for the blessing when I feel like the time is right. Right now, what I need to do is I need to earn your father's respect and trust. Because a father thinks that Patrick went behind his back and kidnapped his little girl and married her and drug her to the United States and all this other stuff. So her father does not have a positive um, perception of Patrick. So he wants to rebuild his reputation with his father-in-law um, and be on the up and up because the reason why they're in this situation to begin with is because Thais was lying to her father from day one. She lied about why she was going to the United States. She hid her relationship with Patrick from her father. So when they finally, when it came time for Patrick to, uh, when it came time for Thais to tell her dad that they were married, the dad already mistrusted Patrick because he was in the dark this whole entire time. So he had no idea. And so Patrick was like, if you would have been more honest with your father from the beginning, I wouldn't be in this situation where I have to prove myself to him, beg for blessings and do all this other mess. Of course, Thais has no response to that. She just completely overlooks what he just said, because it it makes too much sense. So they're going back and forth. And she's like, you're making this a bigger deal than it needs to be. All you got to do is just ask him for the blessing because that's what he expected. We came all the way over here specifically for that. You should have just asked for the blessing. That's what he wanted. And Patrick is still like, no, I'm not going to do that until I'm ready to do that right now. I need to earn his trust. So as they're arguing, he gets a message that his brother John has arrived in Brazil. So he wants to go meet up with his brother. And so Thais is like, but it's my birthday. You're going to go be with your brother when it's my birthday. It's my birthday. Girl, what do you want? This is girl. Look, <clears throat> you already know. I don't care for Thais. Okay, I don't care for her. So every little thing that she does irks me. And I'm just like, okay, he's going to go pick up his brother. Okay, like what is the deal? Why wouldn't he go pick up his brother? I don't understand why she was upset with that. Is he going to pick up John and they're going to go party all night long? Or is he going to pick up John, take him back to the apartment or drop him off at his own hotel and then come back home? Like, I don't understand. I don't, I didn't get why she was so upset. She was so mad that she didn't even want to take the dog up into the apartment. And she was like, well, it's your dog too. She was just being a big baby. So yeah, Patrick, I agree with you. If she hadn't lied to her father to begin with, you're absolutely right. Y'all would not be in this situation that y'all are in right now where the father does not trust him at all. Of course, the father is not going to show any type of um, um, animosity towards Thais because, you know, that's his daughter and she could do no wrong in his eyes. So all of his mistrust and anger is directed towards Patrick and Patrick is just trying to like you know build his reputation up again with his father-in-law but who knows okay moving on to Lauren and Alexi so Lauren goes through surgery it takes hours and hours for the surgery to be done um 
anyways so she goes through surgery she comes out of it and everything is fine of course you know she's coming off the anesthesia and of course when you come out of the anesthesia you act really disoriented kind of like you're drunk you don't know what the hell's going on so that was a really funny moment and Lexi says it's all funny right now but it's not going to get funny when it's not going to be funny anymore when her medication wears off and the pain hits her like a ton of breaks so I'm watching this scene where she's coming out of surgery and then when they're putting her in the car and she's got tubes hanging out of her you know to collect all of the fluid um she's in obviously in a lot of pain and I'm just like girl is it really worth all this was this really worth it, Lauren? I mean, you're a tiny slip of a woman and you felt like you needed to get all this fat sucked out. Look, like I said before, all you needed was, if you're really worried about that little pouch on your stomach, because you've had all these children back to back and you can't get rid of that little pouch and you want your stomach to be more flat, I swear to God, at the age that you're at, and the body type that you have, I swear, I, I think a good trainer would have taken care of that for you. A really good trainer. And if you really were serious about it and you stuck to a really good exercise and diet plan, that would have taken care of that. I really do believe that because I'm looking at her body type. I know a lot of women struggle with that. Now, if you're like an older woman and you have that pouch, I can understand wanting to get it lipoed out. But you're she's fairly young, you know. And her body bounced back quick after having three kids practically back to back. So I felt like um, if she had a good trainer and a good dietary plan, she would have looked fantastic. She looked amazing. She's a small woman. She's not big at all. She's not fat at all. Um, when I saw, you know, how she came out of the surgery and the pain that she was in and, you know, how, how much work it's going to take to help her recover, I just don't think it was worth it. Not at all. I just do not think that it was worth it. And if you wanted bigger boobs, just say I wanted bigger boobs. I mean, I just don't understand. Like if you, I don't know. She claims that, you know, she wanted to, oh, I, I don't know what to say. I just don't think it was necessary. She's an attractive woman. She's young. Um, she doesn't look like she just had three kids. She looks great. Her natural body looked great. And if she had like a good diet plan, that double chin would go away. Her stomach would get flattened. Um, unless she feels like after all of that, she still wanted a bigger butt and bigger boobs. Okay, then just say that that's what you wanted. That look, even if I would have exercised and all the fat went away, my butt still would have been flat and my boobs still would have been small. And that's what I need to work on the most. I need all of that to be bigger. Then girl, then just say that. You know what I mean? Just be honest with it. But I don't know. I just felt like it's not really necessary for someone who looked like her. Now, there are some people I can look at and be like, yeah, you need to get something lipoed out. You need to go through plastic surgery. Yeah, you need it. But then I look at her and I feel like she didn't need it. She did not need it at all. I just hope that this is the last time, the last time that um, she goes under the knife for cosmetic for cosmetic reasons. You know, she was a very attractive girl to begin with. It's really sad that, you know, she's suffering from, she says she's suffering from body dysmorphia, which is the same thing that Jasmine claims that she's suffering from. And I'm like, is it really body dysmorphia or is it that you're just really trying to achieve the impossible? Thank you so much for joining me. I really do appreciate it on your way out. Please don't forget to rate the video. If you like this content, subscribe to my channel and I'll definitely talk to you later. Bye.